I love farming. My background is farming. I grew up growing cotton and millet and rice. When I came here ten, over 10 years ago, we have only two Korean people in Minnesota. Now we have uh, 8,000 Korean people in Minnesota. All of you contribute so much for this country so far. And now we are going back to farm for Minnesota, for this country. Hi, it's very nice to be here. Nice to see you all. How many of you are farming right now? Great, that's great to know. So I'm going to talk about um, how to handle your vegetables after, at harvest and after harvest so that the quality will really be high. Quality of your produce is very important to the end buyer. As local farmers selling in a local market, one of the number one things that I hear from customers is that when they buy at a farmer's market or food from a local farmer, they are afraid the food won't hold up as long um, in their refrigerator. And so the way you handle your food after you harvest it is very, very important for the long-lasting quality, the shelf life, the nutritional levels, and the taste are all affected by how you handle it. That's what we'll be talking a lot about for this next hour and a half. And that quality of your produce will also have a big impact upon your reputation and your relationship with your customers. So you will find that it will help you be much more successful if you pay attention to some of these simple basic practices on how you handle your food. We're also going to talk a little bit about food safety in the, in the, in the practices that we do in the food handling. and the things that we need to take into consideration to make sure that the way we're handling the food after we pick it is going to be safe. Every farm has to think about this um, safety issue because you're feeding people. You are handlers of, of the food and you're responsible for the wellness of that product. So when we start to talk about how to handle food and fresh produce, the very first place we want to start is to really understand that the fresh produce is alive and it breathes. It releases heat and moisture and it can get sick and it can even die. So we're gonna talk about that process. If you think about a plant when it is growing in the ground, how the roots go down into the soil and they take up water and the leaves, they have a relationship with the air and the sun the carbon dioxide in the air, the gas, enters the leaves and works with the sunlight and makes the energy that is stored in the plant. And as long as the plant is in the ground and living, the fresh food that you are growing can replenish that water and it can replenish those nutrients. But as soon as we pick the food and we take it away from the plant, that process is reversed. The food can no longer take in water from the ground. It can no longer make new nutrients and cells from the air and the sun. And so it begins to deteriorate. I want you to do something. Feel the back of your hand and notice the temperature. Notice how warm or cold and notice if it's moist or dry. And then breathe on it a few times. And now feel it again. Tell me, tell me what you feel that is different. What, what do you notice different? Warmer? Maybe moister? You feel some moisture? That is your process of breathing because you are alive. And your fresh produce is, is similar. It's also alive. And it's breathing lets out air and it lets out moisture and it lets out heat. And so vegetables are different than people. Of course, they do not have lungs. They're more like a reptile. And if you think about a snake in the woods, when it's cold, it doesn't move. It just sits still. And when it's warm, it runs through the grass. And so you want to put your vegetables to sleep. 
you want to bring the temperature of the vegetables down very quickly so that they go to sleep. That will slow that respiration breathing process and you won't lose the moisture and the heat as fast, which is what causes the deterioration. I put this slide up here, not because these numbers are important, but I just want to really emphasize to you how important temperature is when you are working with fresh vegetables. If you look at the line across the top, you see different temperatures. 32 degrees is the freezing temperature, and then on up 41, 50, up to 80. And if you look at that first crop of asparagus, you see how the numbers get bigger as the temperatures go up. And that is the amount of respiration, of breathing that those vegetables do as the temperature gets higher. So you can see those numbers get very large as the temperature goes up. So, for air, so it's very important that you bring your vegetables very quickly down to the correct temperature. You want to put them to sleep just like you want to put your children to sleep. It will really help them um, stay fresh longer. So in the manual that you received today, you will find a chart that looks like this and it classifies all the different vegetables accordingly to how quickly they deteriorate at different temperatures. So if they are in the category of very low or low or moderate, those vegetables, you can grow them and sell them in the fresh market without having expensive coolers and, and doing a lot of cooling and they will stay fresh. Potatoes, Cucumbers, tomatoes, winter squash, watermelons, cucumbers, peppers. Those crops do not have to be cooled and kept cold for freshness and they will stay very nice and you will be able to sell them and have a good reputation. Crops that are high, very high and extremely high in breathing and respiration, those crops they must be cooled and they must be kept cold or they will break down very quickly. Crops in that category are like lettuce or sweet corn, kale, spinach, asparagus, parsley. Those crops will spoil very fast if they are not gotten cold quickly. And getting them cold has to happen very fast. If they sit warm for one day, they start to spoil. I'm sure many of you have had this experience. You pick a head of lettuce and it sits warm on a hot day and within a few hours it is getting limp and not um, looking fresh any longer. Whereas you know if you pick a beet and you set it on the counter, it will still look nice in a day. It is not as sensitive. But what if you leave the leaves on the beet? then it must be gotten cold because those leaves are green and they will spoil very quickly. So the first step in this process after you pick the vegetable really starts right at harvest. I took these two pictures on, in September and the picture in the middle is a thermometer and it says that it is 58 degrees outside. And then I put a temperature thermometer inside of a head of broccoli and you can see that the head of broccoli is only 45 degrees. So that is very good. That broccoli is nice and cool. Ideally, you want to get it even a little cooler, but that's cool enough and it will stay very fresh. If you pick it early in the morning like this when it is cool, you won't have to do a lot of work cooling it further. But then this picture on the right, I took that in the afternoon at 4 o'clock and then the air temperature was 88 degrees and the broccoli was 82 degrees. Well now that broccoli is very warm, it is going to spoil very quickly if it's not cooled. So it's going to take time and money to get that field heat out of that broccoli and it has to happen fast. So if you can pick your vegetables when it's cool out, early in the morning before the sun has heated them up, that is the really important first step that you can do to get the quality down. And if you do pick it in the afternoon when it's hot, you must have a way to cool these crops that are so sensitive quickly. And even if you can cool them quickly, the quality will never be as good as if you had picked them when they're cool. 
So the number one step is to know which of the crops that you're growing you must cool very quickly and try to pick them when the, it is hot, before it's hot, early in the morning. All those fresh greens and broccoli, your lettuce, your spinaches. This is an example of broccoli and you can see how quickly it can turn yellow when it's warm and the buds start to open up. And the customer doesn't like it as much when it's yellow. They want to get a nice dark green head. Picking it when it's cool and keeping it cool will help a lot. Once it's picked, it's very important that you get it out of the sun. As soon as the box is filled, take it to the shade, put it in a truck with a cover. Maybe you have a wagon and you could build a little roof over the top. Or if you have a cart, make a tarp over the top. If you have a field with some trees, um, you can put them there. Don't let the boxes sit in the field, many boxes full. As soon as the box is full, get it out of the sun. And then quickly take it to where you're going to pack it, if you have refrigeration on your farm or a cool place where you keep it. That should happen very quickly. Another thing that's important to think about at harvest is whether you can pick the vegetables dry or wet because early in the morning it is often wet from the dew or if it has rained. Crops like tomatoes or peppers, those crops, you should pick them when they are dry. If you pick them when they are wet, it really increases the amount of disease that the crops have. When they are wet, the pores in the leaves open and your hands can have the pathogens form the disease on them because they are in the soil and in the air. And then if you touch the plants, it's very easy for the disease to enter the plant. So it's important to harvest tomatoes and peppers, all the crops that are related to that family when they are dry. That's also true about um, crops like cucumbers and watermelon and winter squash all the crops that are in the cucurbit family. They are very sensitive to fungal diseases. Think about um, green beans. If you pick them when they are wet, it causes them to get a disease called rust. And the t green beans will have like little um, red brown spots on them. So you would want to pick those when they are not wet. Other things such as fresh greens, the brassica crops, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kale, sweet corn, asparagus, those crops will last best if you pick them when they are wet. So it's fine to pick them early in the morning or right after a rain. For a crop like an onion or a root crop, those you can pick if they're wet or if they're dry. If you're going to sell them fresh, it's fine to pick them either. If you want to keep them for a very long time, then it's best if you pick them when they're not muddy. Think about not damaging the produce. Every time the produce is handled, it's very easy to puncture it or scratch it or to give it a bruise. Sometimes it's hard to see those spots right away. It's like if you bruise your arm, you know how you don't notice it right away and then later you see a bruise and you think, Oh, where did that come from? I don't remember hitting myself because it doesn't show up right away. And it's the same with many vegetables. If you aren't really gentle when you pick them, you might bruise them and then you might sell them and you don't even know it's got a bruise and then your customer finds the bruise. We want to make our customers very happy so they come again and again and again and make sure we haven't damaged them so think about trimming your fingernails so you won't scratch the food. Take off your jewelry and leave that um, in a safe place instead of wearing it while you pick. It can be very good to wear gloves. Soft cotton gloves will help to pad your hands so you won't damage the food. When you pick the produce, I always like to say, fresh produce should be seen but not heard. And that's because when you pick it and set it in the container, set it down gently. Don't drop it, Wait, take it all the way to the bottom before you let it go and make sure you don't bruise it. Think about when you bring it in, if you are driving in a truck or pushing a cart, 
don't go really fast, you know, go nice and slow so you don't bounce the vegetables up and down. Think about how full you make your container. If you make it very full and the food is gentle, fragile, like a tomato, it can cause compression damage, so don't make your containers too full. For something like a tomato, those stems could scratch their neighbors. So we like to take them off and set them in the box stem side down so they won't scratch their neighbors. Some people like to sell tomatoes with the stem on because it's very pretty. If you want to do that, be sure you pick them and put them in a box in a way that they won't turn and scratch their neighbors. A friend of mine who worked for me took this picture and you can see the bad spot on the squash. Well, I had taught her when she worked for us to trim the stems of the squash straight, not in an angle, because then you make a nice little knife, and to set them in the box with the stem side out. And she knew that and did that really well when she worked for us. Then she started her own farm, and she was um, not used to training her helpers yet, so she just told them to pick the squash, but she didn't instruct them to put the stems out. And so they just picked them, and they didn't understand that the stems would scratch the other squash. And about three weeks later, she took this picture because almost half of her squash had rotted where it got scratched from another squash. So even when you understand these things really well about protecting the food in the box, be sure you have educated and told the people who are working for you so that they understand it. One important thing to remember is what you should bring in from the field or what you should leave out. I put this picture of a tomato here because you can see it has a small crack, but this crack is pretty well scarred over. If that crack was well scarred and it's not leaking any juice, I would have that picked and bring in and I would sell it. But you can see how it's wet there in the stem area and that's juice that is leaking. If that tomato is picked and put in a box, in a few days it will have caused about 10 tomatoes. All the tomatoes near it will then also spoil. And so then you will lose many tomatoes. It's really best to leave anything with a puncture wound or that is, not, um, that is oozing a fluid to just not even pick it in unless you're going to put it in a separate container to eat for yourself. But if you bring that in with the food that you will sell, it causes the other food to spoil. Another very important thing to be aware of for food safety when you're harvesting is to watch for animal tracks or animal poop. In this picture, you can see some deer uh, poop on the ground and a deer footprint. You want to watch for bird droppings. And if you see any sign of that, you should not pick that food and sell it. The animal feces, the animal poop can have bacteria and different um, disease organisms that cause human beings to get sick. You should train your people helping you to watch for it. And if they see it, don't walk through it, but walk around it and then tell you so that you can mark down that that was there and that you didn't pick it. If anyone ever does get sick from food that you eat and you have kept good records showing that you watch for this sort of problem, it would really help you um, have to answer questions. You might also want to have a way of scaring birds away from your fields um, so that they don't come in and uh, poop on your crops when you are ready to harvest. On the top picture, you can see that that's called a bird scare. It's like a round balloon that you can hang in a field of something like strawberries, which birds like so much. And that will help to scare them away. You know, the best trick I ever found was the radio turned to a talk show. And I think those ministers are even the most effective, the preachers that are shouting all night long. I think the animals know it's a sin to steal the food from us. <laughs> a few other things to think about when you harvest your vegetables for food safety is it's important to clean your knives and your boxes. You can purchase a simple plastic container like this and have two of them, one with water and some soap and the other one with some sanitizer. I'll show you some types of sanitizers you can use in a little while. 
if you have them set up in the morning when you start work, then it doesn't take very much time to simply take your knife and put it in the soap and in the sanitizer and then go to the field. But you know, if these things aren't set up ahead, then it takes so much time and it won't likely happen. Have them set up ahead, it makes all the difference in the world. Make it easy to do it the way you need to. Also with washing boxes, if there was only one tool you could afford to buy, I would suggest you buy a pressure washer. They cost about $150 and they will make the water come out very hard. Without a pressure washer to wash your boxes, you have to scrub them with a scrub brush and it's very slow. So it's important that your boxes are cleaned really every day and have someone assigned who's responsible to do that. They could start early in the morning or do it at the end of the day, but they should be cleaned out before they go to the field. The other important aspects of sanitation for food safety is there must be some sort of toilet, whether it's a running water toilet or a porta potty, but a safe place to go to the bathroom and a place to wash hands with potable water, water that is safe to drink. If you don't have running water on the farm, you can make a portable hand washing station. You could purchase um, a water jug that has a spout and lay it on its side. You can purchase them for about eight or ten dollars. You should have soap and a trash can with a lid for paper towels. It's important that you have um, paper towels so you're not using the same cloth for food safety between different people. That's an important thing to have on the farm so that the workers can wash their hands after they go to the bathroom and not get their own um, pathogens on the food that people will eat. As you're picking, as much as possible, keep the produce clean. All vegetables should be clean when they are sold. That's a very important thing. That doesn't mean they have to be washed. It's possible to get many vegetables clean without washing them. So as much as possible, you want to keep them clean at harvest. And sometimes that just involves a little bit of training if people are helping you. If you think about something like broccoli, it's already clean. It's not on the ground, and it is clean. So you don't want to get it dirty when you are picking it. But if you are not careful, you'll get a little dirt on your knife, and then when you cut the broccoli stem, then the dirt gets on the broccoli stem. Well, that actually could be a food safety problem because the pathogens that we want to be sure don't get in our food that may come from all sorts of different wild animals are often in the soil. So we don't want to take the soil and accidentally smear it across the cut space where it's easy for those pathogens to go inside the vegetables. So we want to be sure the knife is clean and not getting dirt on the bottom there where we're cutting. And think about your hands. If you get some dirt on your hands and then put it on the top of the head of broccoli while you cut it, then you will get dirt on the broccoli. So by just taking a little bit of care as we're harvesting, it's very possible to pick the broccoli and keep it clean and then it will not have to be washed. Other crops like cabbage, for example, those crops will get soil down in the bottom areas where the mud splash leshes up. But if you cut them at just the right spot, it's just above the mud, these lower leaves will kind of block the mud. You can cut just below these tighter leaves inside and there won't be mud there and you will be able to cut it and not get dirt across the cut edge and that will keep it clean. It's important for some crops like cabbage because cabbage should actually not be washed. Many people do wash cabbage, but when you get wash it, you get water inside those leaves, and then they spoil much faster. It won't keep as well. Some crops, like tomatoes, they also should not be washed. Many people wash them, but they are very sensitive to taking pathogens in where the stem is. And if you wash them in water, that can cause um, disease problems for people. Usually with a crop like tomatoes, if you wear soft cotton gloves and if you pick them when they are dry, you can simply polish the soil off at harvest. 
Something like a watermelon, it's fine, it's okay to wash a watermelon. That will not hurt the watermelon, but it's extra work. And there's always enough work to do on a farm. There's no reason to look for any more. So if you wear cotton gloves and you pick them when they are not really wet, oftentimes you can just polish them and you will not have to wash them anymore. For crops that you will have to wash, like leeks, you can often leave much of the soil and the leaves that you're not going to sell right in the field and then they won't be extra work. You can see he got that leek pretty clean and it was very quick. And then he'll bring that in and just rinse it off and it'll be ready to go for market. I like that one. He really did a great job of getting that soil off. It was pretty dirty. Other crops, there are crops that you should never ever wash such as strawberries or raspberries. You wouldn't wash those crops until right before you eat them. So it's important that the way you grow them keeps them clean. With something like strawberries, you would put mulch or plastic underneath them so they don't get dirty at harvest. Something like raspberries are often grown on a trellis so that they won't touch the ground. Other crops that should not be washed include Brussels sprouts, summer squash, zucchini, and cabbage. The manual that you are receiving today has a whole page on the proper way um, which vegetables you can wash and which ones you should not wash. So you can look to that as a reference for your particular crops. Now crops that are very, very dirty, such as root crops, those crops should be spray washed. They should not be put into a tank of water until they have taken most of the soil off. And that is important because many people pick these when they're dirty and they put them right into a tank of water. But that could cause a food safety problem because the soil is where the pathogens that people are concerned about causing foodborne illnesses are. And if you place some very dirty produce vegetables in a tank of water, then those pathogens are able to go inside the vegetable, uh, be taken into the vegetable. So it's important to wash the very dirty vegetables with a sprayer before you put them in water. You can see that's not a very expensive setup. You can do this very inexpensively. In this picture, you see they just have a hose with a shutoff valve on the end and they're spraying. It's very simple. And you can make yourself a screen table without spending very much money. This one is from our farm. We just took a metal frame and cut the legs off and then we put galvanized steel over that. I like it this way with no legs because we can get it out of the way when we are not using it. It doesn't take up a lot of space. And then when we want to use it, we just take some field totes and we stack them up and make legs with the field totes. Or we might set it on the end of our wash tub and, and then use it to dry things. So you can make one very inexpensively. Now I put this picture in because I want you to help me find some problems in this picture. There are four things happening here that are causing the product to not last as long and are some food safety problems. Does anyone see something that should be changed that could be a problem? Shade. shade, yes. Someone said shade. This should not be in the full sun like this. That will cause those vegetables to spoil very, very quickly. OK, I'm going to tell you a couple I see. Do you see the wooden wall behind the washer? It has peeling paint. And that paint could fall on the food, and then people would eat that. It might even be lead paint. It's very old. It might have lead in it. And because they are spraying there, they might knock the water against the wall very easily, and that would knock the paint into the food. Do you see that this table is made out of wood? Well, they have the screen on the bottom. If the screen was on the top, Wood could have splinters and the food might touch that. So if they just move that screen to the top, that would be a little bit safer. But there's one more that's a very big problem. And I took this picture off the internet. I don't know who this is. 
but it's a good example because we find when we visit our own farms, there's things that we haven't noticed. And it's very important that you look at your own places that you are handling the vegetables and make sure you're doing it safe. So the one that's left yet is that roof. Think about the birds fly over the roof and then they poop on the roof and then when it rains, the rain will wash the diseases that is, are in the bird's poop onto this wash table. So it is important to think about where the birds fly and not setting things where the water will be from the roof coming down and washing those um, to there. Another way to wash um, root crops can be right in the field tote that you've harvested into. If they're about half full, you can spray the vegetables on the top and then just sort of tip the box from side to side and continue to spray. And that can be a good way to wash them if you don't have too many. So when we talk about water, we've been talking about washing vegetables. It's very important that you wash your vegetables with water that is safe to drink. If the water is not safe for you to drink because it has pathogens in it, um, then it is also not safe to wash your vegetables with because it could get the pathogens on the vegetables. If you're using water that is from a city system, then that water has been tested and it's safe to use. If you're using it from a well, you should have it twisted two times a year once in spring and then again in August. And you can go to the Department of Health wherever you live, your county um, offices, and they will give you a small bottle to, t to bring them a water sample and it will have instructions about how to take the sample. It is important that you take the sample the correct way or you might get pathogens in it that aren't actually in the water. They might be outside of the faucet. The instructions will be on the container, so if you cannot read it, ask someone to read it for you if you don't know the language. I don't know if they come in other languages, those instructions. It doesn't cost very much to sample the water. I think it's about $15. Also, ask them to test it for how many pathogens are in it not just are there pathogens. Because if there, are, there is an amount that is considered safe and you want to be sure they test for how much. It is very important that you do not wash with water from a river or a pond or a stream, water that is above the ground. It's very easy for diseases to enter that water from wildlife or from pollutants or from chemicals could enter from a farm. Another way to clean vegetables is to wash them in a tank of water with a brush. And that can, um, crops such as cucumbers, peppers, you might wash that way, or winter squash could be washed that way. I'm going to show you a mechanical brush washer because this, I told you already that if I could only buy you one tool, I would buy a pressure washer. Well, if I could buy you a second tool, I would buy a mechanical brush washer. Many farms could use this much sooner than they realize. If you are packing, if you are selling $500 worth of vegetables when you wash your vegetables, I think it will pay for this machine. It is so much faster. If you wash by hand, it's about four or five boxes an hour maybe. This machine, they sell, they say, 100 boxes an hour, but that would take five people. When I use it with two people, it's 30 to 40 boxes in an hour. And it gets them so much cleaner than if I wash them by hand. And it saves so much time. This picture shows four different sections. You don't need all of the sections. You can buy them as individuals. The most important section is this one called a washer sprayer and it has brushes inside. I'm going to show some videos to you so that you can see how it works. The first section here that's the feed belt, that just turn, rolls. You put food on it 
and it feeds it into the washer. That's not a very important or necessary part of the machine. If you wanted to save money, you could not buy that part and you wouldn't really miss it. You could just stand and put the food right into the sprayer area. After it's washed, it will come out on these drying sponges and they take off the excess moisture so the food won't rot as quickly. And this last section is the rotating pack table. That also is a, a section that you could avoid purchasing if you wanted to save money. But when I show you the picture, I think you will all want one. If you buy the entire machine, they cost around $3,000 new. Sometimes you can find them used. I have purchased just the washing section sometimes for three or four hundred dollars. And you can use that section just alone if you want. Put the vegetables in and then have it come out and have them go into a box that you would pack out. There's two good sources to buy them from. One is Market Farm Implement and the other is Rooters Farm Implement. They both carry them new and used. Um, and then you can also just watch in Craigslist or place an ad or at the farmer's market in the newsletter. Many people will sell them used and you can sometimes find them that way. So here is a video showing the inside of the washing part. And you can see it's a simple design. The brushes turn and the water sprays on them and then the vegetables move through um, the washer. And it's quite gentle. You don't have to worry about them being damaged or cut or damaged going through there. Then they move out onto these drying sponges and they just take off the extra moisture. Here is the round table part and you can see how it moves them in a circle. It makes it much easier to find the bad spots and look at them without having to pick them up. I packed vegetables for over 25 years and this saved me a lot of damage to my arms and my wrists because if you don't have that table, you pick the vegetable up and you have to turn it to look for the bad spots and make your decision about where you should sell it. And that's very hard on your wrists and your arms. For many years I had a lot of pain. And then when I got this round table that turned so nice, it saved so much um, damage to my own body because I could just sort of flick the vegetable and roll it and then I could see all the sides without having to um, handle them manually. So I am very happy I got that because it saved me so much um, labor. We're also going to look at washing vegetables in a tank of water. And this is the type of washing where you must be the most careful for s food safety reasons. Because when you put vegetables into water and they're immersed inside of the water, it's like a flower. You know, if you buy a flower, you cut a flower, you put it in a vase of water so that the water will go into the flower and keep it fresh. And the vegetables will do the same thing. They will take the water inside of them to stay fresh. And that's good if you want the water there to keep them crisp and fresh. But you must be very careful because if there are any diseases inside of the water, then that disease can go inside of the vegetable. Once the disease has gone inside the vegetable, the danger is that many people eat vegetables without cooking them and then those diseases can cause um, serious foodborne illnesses that can kill people. So when you put vegetables in water, it's very important that you have good, clean practices. You should never ever pick vegetables that have bird feces on them. If you then put them in water, those feces, those germs can spread and get on the other vegetables and they can go inside of the vegetables. It's important that the people who are putting their hands in the water to take the vegetables in and out have gotten good um, hand washing practices. 
So it's important that your tank is a clean tank, that it has been cleaned and scrubbed, and that your water is clean. And then think about the vegetables. Many of the diseases that we are concerned about can be in the soil. So when you pick them, we, that soil, if it is on the vegetable and you put it in the tank of water, then you, put, you could have put these diseases into the tank of water. I showed you earlier that you could spray wash vegetables. And it's, it's safer if you spray wash them than if you put them in the tank of water. There also could be diseases on the people's hands that put them in the water. And many of these types of diseases, pathogens, we cannot see them. Um, and so it's important that we follow good sanitation practices so we aren't putting them in with our hands or with the tools that we use, the boxes or the knives. Usually the germs will come either from soil, whether an, a wild animal has passed through and pooped on the soil, or from a worker who's gone to the bathroom and hasn't fully washed their hands. And you will not see those germs. So you need to have safe practices in place. And be very aware that before you put fresh vegetables into a tank of water, they should have been spray washed. They might not be perfectly washed. Something like um, salad mix, you know, small little leaves, they will have a little bit of dirt on them. But you'll want to have washed most of the dirt off before it goes in a tank of water. Now you might be putting it in a tank of water because you want to cool it. If the vegetable is warm from the air and the sun and the water is cold, then the water will cool it down and that can be very helpful. Or you might want to put the vegetables in the water to crisp them. You might want the water to go inside the vegetables to help them be very fresh. Just be sure that before you do that, you have removed the soil and that you have been practicing safe sanitation by washing your hands and by washing your tools and your boxes so that there aren't germs that you cannot see going into the water and then spreading on the vegetables and going inside of the vegetables. It's important that you wash this tank out. You should change the water like once an hour as you are using it. Don't use the same water all day long. Drain it out and, and scrub it and rinse it and put a sanitizer on it. I'm going to show you some sanitizer options. And you might want to have more than one tank. You might have your first tank where you have done um, a first rinse like with something like salad mix, and then you might take it out and put it into a second tank that's even colder to make the food get cold quickly. There are products that it is a very good idea to put in the water. They're called sanitizers, and they will kill some of the germs that are in the water. They will not kill all of the germs. You still have to have good, safe practices. The two products that I recommend the most are called Tsunami and Sanidate. They're from a company called Ecolab, and you can um, have them purchased and mailed to you. And the reason I like those two products is that uh, they are very safe to use. They do not require a rinse, and you do not have to monitor the pH of the water. So they're very simple to use, and it's safe if when you're finished with the water, if you empty the water out and it's not going through a septic system, but just going into a woods or on the ground, they are safe to use. They're not going to cause pollution. Some people use chlorine bleach, um, and it's easy to get at a store, but you should not buy it if it's scented or oxidized. If you go to the store, some of them will have a smell, a scent. You do not want to use that. Um, I don't myself like to use chlorine bleach, but many farmers use it. 
The reason I don't like it is it has to be rinsed off, so it adds an extra job for you, more work. We don't want any more work. We have enough work. It also has to have the pH of the water controlled. If the pH is not right, it will not be effective. And that means you take a little test strip and you dip it in, and if the pH is not right, you have to add vinegar. Again, more work, which is why I do not like it. It also can't be spilled into the woods or on the ground if it's very concentrated. If it has more than 10 parts per million, it cannot be spilled. So it can cause pollution problems. So I have put it up there today, not because I'm recommending it, but because many people use it. And so I want to tell you these problems with it and these considerations you will have to take if you do use it. It's important that you test um, that you have the right amount. And this is not hard to do. If you buy the Tsunami or the Sanidate from Ecolab, they also have test strips that you can purchase. And it's just a little strip of paper. After you put the sanitizer in the water, you can dip the strip into the water, and it will turn a different color. There will be a little chart on the container that shows you what color it should be. And then you can make sure you have the right amount. Oh, that's a wonderful question. She said, do you have to let people know that you have used the sanitizer? No, you do not have to let people know. It is not a chemical in the sense that it is not a dangerous chemical. The sanitizer is made from something called hydrogen peroxide, and it is safe to use. That was a very good question, because consumers are very concerned about what is in their food. Some people like to wash things in a tank of water, right in the field tote, in the box it was picked in. This can save a lot of work. The food will be kept together, and you won't have to fence it, bring it all in. It also protects the food, because it won't be bumping into the other food in the water. If you do this, you want to be sure that your field box is not dirty. If there is dirt on the bottom of the box, or you haven't washed the box, then you would be putting all of that dirt into the water. And that could have pathogens in it, germs that could cause sickness. So it's important before you put those in the water that they have been cleaned and that they did not get dirty while you were picking. On the picture on the top, you can see that before they are putting them in the water, she is spraying a lot of the dirt off of the cut ends so that they're already pretty clean before they go in the water. Then they'll go in and they'll get cleaned more and being in the water will cool them, will hydrate them, they will take water in and become crisper and fresher. This is an example of washing green beans where they are just putting the beans in the water. And that is fine. There is no problem with that. Here is a video showing how to watch uh, small salad greens. And you can see this is a simple, um, inexpensive plastic tote. The water is clean enough. Um, it was well water. And she has put the lettuce in and let it sit there and cool. And then she takes it out and puts it into a net. Those are just laundry nets that you can put um, them into. Um, when I asked her to make this video for me, she did. And then after she made it, she noticed that she wasn't cleaning her equipment properly. Do you see how dirty the wash machine is? And she had never thought about it. So her process is good. She's putting them into a washing machine that's not used for washing anymore. It's only used to spin the water out of the lettuce. And she'll spin it on the spin cycle. But the problem was that she was not washing her machinery. And after she watched this video, she realized, oh, it is very important that she washes her machine. 
Now she's putting it on a screen table to dry just a little and to look through it for any bugs or bad leaves. And then she will put it into bags to sell it. So it's important that you wash your machinery. And one very good trick that can help you is to have different color brushes because, of course, you don't want to wash your vegetables with the same brush that you wash your toilet or your floor, where there could be diseases that you don't want on your vegetables. So on this farm, they have yellow brushes for cleaning a bathroom and red brushes for cleaning the machines and green brushes for cleaning the vegetables. That helps to prevent an accident. When I started talking, I told you that temperature is very, very important for the quality and the long lasting of your vegetables. So it's important that you know the proper temperature for each vegetable. The manual that you received has a page like this that tells the correct temperature. And you will see that some of the crops, like your lettuce and broccoli, needs to be very cold. But some crops, like cucumbers, they don't need to be as cold. And if you get them too cold, you will cause damage to them. They shouldn't be below 45 or 50 degrees. If you do get them too cold, this is the sort of damage that happens very, very quickly. And again, like the bruises, it doesn't show up immediately. So you could cause the damage on your farm by putting it in your room cooler and then getting them too cold, and it will show up in a day or two. And you might not even know it. Let's talk a little bit about room coolers, where you have a room that is cold. It can be a very useful thing to have on the farm. Um, how many of you are farming on land that you don't own? So if it is um, land that you don't own and you don't, if you don't have a building, it can be a little harder to make a room cooler. Some people like to make a portable cooler. You could make one in a trailer. That can be very useful because you can use it on the farm and then you can also use it to go to the farmer's market or to make your deliveries. So I want to tell you about an inexpensive way to make a cooler. You could make, you can use an air conditioner and then you buy a unit called a cool bot. If you can go on the internet, you can look up cool bot and you'll find this little black box in this picture there's instructions on how to hook it up to an air conditioner, and it will make the air conditioner go down to 36 degrees, which is, is nice and cold. And it is much less expensive than putting in an, a compressor to use for a, making a cool room, and it's less expensive to use and less expensive to fix. So that can be a good way to do it on a farm. You could put it on a truck. You could put it on a trailer. Some people tell me they use a refrigerator to cool their vegetables. Well, if the vegetable is already cold, a refrigerator is a good way to keep it cold. But if it's warm, there is no airflow in the refrigerator. So it is very, very slow way to cool vegetables and really is not fast enough if you are going to be selling them and if they are warm. So important that you kick the air out. And there's one other tool I want to tell you about, which is called air cooling. So if you put your vegetables in a cold room and you put a very big fan next to them and then a tarp over the top of the vegetables, you can pull the cold air through the vegetables and it will cool them much faster. It can be a, a good way to do it if you have a cold room on your farm. I went to Sam's Club and bought a big fan that was three and a half feet around across for $300 and put it up against stacks of vegetables 
and pulled the air through it. And that was very quick compared to just putting it in a room. Uh, when you do that, you have to think about if you are, um, all that air moving through takes moisture with it. So it's okay while you're cooling it, but as soon as the vegetables are cool, you must stop the moisture or you will dry the vegetables out and then they would not be good. I want you to know about this tool called a cool and ship because you can get the plans to make one of these and they're not very expensive. North Carolina State has the plans online and there is a link to it from the manual you received. Any of the online references that I make today, I have them linked from my website, atinadifley.com. There's a farmer resource page you can go to and there are many of these references. So I want to tell you about this tool, Cool and Ship, because it's very um, affordable for small farmers. It is made on a pallet with a styrofoam box, the styrofoam you would buy in a building supply store. And you make a box with the styrofoam. And then they hook it up to an air conditioner and the cool bot unit that I showed you just now. That then has a fan and it forces the air through and cools very quickly. And the reason they call it a cool and ship is because it's on a pallet. So then you can put the entire box on the back of your truck and it will keep it cold when you go to deliver it. So that can be a way to get a, a, a machine that will cool for you and keep your full food cold as you're going to town to deliver. And they're, don't, they're not very expensive compared to um, building a cooler truck. Ice is a really useful tool on a farm and is a very good way to cool food quickly. You can't use ice on all food. Crops like broccoli and asparagus, sweet corn, kale, those foods you can put ice on. Other foods such as carrots, you can put ice on carrots. People usually don't. It's not very necessary, but it could be useful. Did you ever take carrots to the farmer's market on a hot day? And then very quickly they became limp and dull and they weren't very nice. I took this picture of the carrots with ice on them at the Minneapolis farmer's market. And the farmer who had them, she was making a lot of money because the carrots looked so fresh and crisp and glistening. When she opened the box, she put them in the trays and they sold very quickly. It was a hot day when I took this picture and the farmer next to her did not have ice and their carrots were very limp and not nice looking and they were not selling at all. So having ice is a very useful tool if you're going to the farmer's market to keep your food cold at the market. I encourage if you sell at a farmer's market, ask the market to buy an ice machine that is just there for the farmers to use. And then you could go with buckets, you could use it for your displays, you could have it to put your broccoli on, um, and those crops that are so sensitive to warm weather, and that would really help the quality at the farmer's market. Um, because ice machines are expensive, they're hard to sometimes buy on your own farm. It's hard to buy one for less than $1,000, and that's used. A new one might be 5000 but if you can't afford one on your farm, it would be a good thing to have at the farmer's market. And I want to talk about one more thing here about um, trucking and shipping. And that is if you are delivering in a vehicle without refrigeration, how many of you have trucks that do not have refrigeration that you drive your vegetables to town with? Be sure you insulate the truck because a lot of heat comes up from the road and the sun on the top and the walls. You can go to 
um, a building supply store and get that foam insulation and put it on the walls and the ceiling and the floor and then cover that with plywood. And that will really help keep your truck cooler. And before you load it, park it in the shade so that it's not as hot when you load it. If you have the food cold on the farm, if you have a room cooler and you've made it cold, then if you put it into the insulated truck and cover it with insulated blankets, it will stay pretty cold. I've done that and gone to town for like four or five hours of delivery and the food stayed cold. I took those movers blankets that are sewn and insulated, but any kind of thick blanket and put them over the boxes of cold food and it will hold that cold in. So that's a good way to do that. I want you to think a little bit about where you're packing your food. If it have a building that you've made or if you have a roof to keep the sun off. Be sure you walk through and look for any sort of animal feces. I took this picture in my own packing shed just a few months ago. And you can see that there are some bird feces on the floor. And there is the walk-in cooler. So this is a problem. If someone walks through those feces and they're carrying boxes and then they go in the cooler, they could be spreading uh, serious food diseases. You can see this is the ceiling above where those bird poop is. I have a bird net to prevent this from happening. But when I looked up, I found a hole in the net. So I never had this problem before. The net was keeping the birds from coming and landing on these rafters. So be sure you have a way to keep the birds out. And if you have a setup, you still need to watch and make sure it's working because it might work and then it might stop working. Think about um, setting the boxes on the ground. Once the produce has been washed and put in a box, it's not a, you do not want to put those boxes on the ground. So if you can make a little pallet, this is just two pieces of wood with some plywood over the top, and then the boxes are set on that so they won't be on the ground, and the two-wheeler dolly for carrying the boxes can slide right under it, and that will save carrying those boxes so much. Try to think about the supplies that you use and keeping them clean. Here are some clam shells that people use to put berries in, and they are just sitting on the ground, getting dusty and dirty, and there are some moths. If it was covered with a sheet of plastic to keep them clean, that would be a good idea. Here you see how they are keeping their tomato boxes covered under plastic, and that can be a really good idea to do that. Thank you for coming and good crops next summer.